Good morning. It's good to be with you for worship this morning. Um, just a, a couple of announcements. Um, so uh, Holiday Bible Club is on from Monday the 14th to Wednesday the 16th of August um, from 7 to 8 in the evening. Kirk Session minutes for those who receive hard copies are asked to collect them in the minister's room. And Glow, um, after our, our service last week, will, it will, will pause for the summer, but Children's Church will be running. And there's a note there if you're able to help with that um, in the announcements, please email the office. And Coffee and Chat is continuing. Duffy's not here. It is. Thank you very much. That's, that's the key part. There's a, I'm aware that there, there was a bit of a clarification around that. Um, Jim Little is on, is on a well-deserved holiday this week. Um, so if you have anybody who requires, um, or who's in a pastoral emergency, please contact myself or your elder. Um, from next Saturday, I'll be off for really about 15 days. Um, and so John Dunlop will take uh, worship next Sunday morning, and then George Moore will take the following week. Um, we're going to pause meeting for prayer on Sunday evenings until mid-August um, with, with a couple of things in mind. One, we've been studying and looking at Sabbath for the last four weeks. And part of the rhythm of Sabbath, it's been, it's been really good content. We can send you a link to it because it's all online if that's something you'd like to follow up on. But the idea is that you would stop, that you would rest, that you would delight, and that you would worship it's quite hard to do that if you're really busy. And so part of the opportunity is to apply some of that, to actually apply some of what we've reflected on in terms of Sabbath and to give space for that. But I'm aware for some, they would like an evening service. And so Presbytery have some, some of the churches in Presbytery are running individual evening services during the summer. And we'll put the details for that in the announcements. Um, so you'll know where they'll be really for most of the summer, not all of it, but for most of it, we'll put, we'll put those dates in the announcements um, for next week for evening services over the summer. But the encouragement would be to apply what we've been learning about in terms of Sabbath. So maybe it's a time to spend time with some family on a Sunday evening, or maybe it's a time to organize to see some people in the church family you haven't seen. There's a whole world there for us to explore, or maybe you just need to rest. And the rest is important, as most of the world looks to, well, if you have kids in school, Friday at 12, if you hear a scream and a shout, it's because the children have got off. But the shout might be louder from teachers who are, who are waiting for it uh, as that comes. But there's a space where we'll move into the holiday season. Let me read you from Psalm 25. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Some things are very, very simple. And as we gather for worship this morning, we remind ourselves in our worship that it's the Lord that we trust. And it's not even the quantity of your trust. We trust in the Lord and the Lord does everything else. If you trust in God, it's God who you trust in for salvation, for forgiveness, for a new life in him, to be brought into his family. Ultimately, to live in this life trusting him and trusting him in the life beyond. Let us worship God. We begin our service this morning with the words of come people of the risen king. Let's stand and praise God together.
we're going to do our kids song next, which is God is for me. There are actions for this, um, but I'm not going to bring the kids up this morning. I'm going to get you to stay where you are. And I would like you to try and teach a few of the people around you how to do these actions. So if you can remember them, see if you can pass them on to somebody else near you today. And we'll see if we can get it spreading out a little bit. Okay, so God is for me. I discovered there that I don't know the actions at all if somebody isn't at the front to tell me what to do. <laughs> I was with you for the actions and I was thinking I don't know where I'm meant to put my hands. You do need to be led. Let's pray together. Father, even as we sing that you are for us, we confess that often we don't believe this. Often we think we have to convince you or to get you on side, or to do things a certain way. And yet, Father, what we find in the gospel is that you are for us. That you are working in our lives and in the lives of those around us to bring about your ways. Because you love us. Because you want people to come to know you because that is the greatest thing they can have in their lives. So much of life as we live it will fade away, it will not last, and yet our relationship with you will last because you want us to be in relationship with you and you have done everything it takes for that to happen. And all we have to do is trust you because you are for us. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your care over us. 
We thank you that as God, your love is consistent. It does not waver. It does not run out or grow tired or weary or brittle. You love us with an overflowing love. A love that spills out of you. That we can know through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that you love us. But we also find it in the reality of the Holy Spirit moving into our lives. Because you are so for us that you indwell in us when we trust in you. As God, you are greater and better than anything else. We thank you for your care for us and your love for us. We pray that in our worship this morning, as we celebrate communion and as in boys and girls go out, that in all the places we are, that we would know your love in real and substantial ways. That we would know deeply in our bones that you are for us, for each of us, in our lives individually and in our life together. We thank and praise you and give you honor and glory because you are better than anything else. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name and the gathered people of God said, Amen, amen. Boys and girls, if you'd like to go out to Children's Church. We're going to continue to worship God in our offering, and as we do that, we're also going to sing and continue to worship.
going to come and lead us in our prayers for others. It might be just a wee bit different this morning. <coughs> prayer. There's a lot said about prayer and rightly so, and there's been a lot written by very clever people and good, good evangelical uh, folk. I came across this little piece a few weeks ago, uh, and that was written by John Newton, and I think we all know who John uh, Newton was and the many things that uh, he uh, uh, had to do and say. And this is what he said about prayer, called the Christian prayer. Prayer is the greatest thing in the life of a Christian. Sometimes we may struggle what to pray for. Do we pray too much? Ask for too many things? John Newton has this to say. We are coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such God will always be able to listen to what we have to say. And John Newton, lots of things happened in his life, and he prayed a lot and was blessed uh, in the work that he done. And so we know that God wants us as his people to pray because we are speaking to God and God wants us as his people to speak to him. Now let's continue with the rest of our prayers this morning. And first of all, let us give thanks and then we will be praying for Ukraine and Russia again and others uh, and uh, the persecuted church. And we will have a little thing to say about our own province. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we give you thanks and praise for all we have received from you, especially, especially the gift of life 
you have given us when you died on the cross. You shed your blood, which cleanses us from sin and sets us free from sin. Your word tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission from sin. And that is why Jesus died, so that we could be, as his blood would shed our take our sins away from us. Lord, we continue to pray for the nation of Ukraine who are continuing to suffer from an evil dictator, more so since the destruction of the dam. This has caused many problems for the folk of this country. At now, the country of Russia itself has been having problems Though from what I hear this morning, it has been solved, more or less. Uh, but perhaps what happened, this may bring peace and end the suffering in this place for both Russia and Ukraine. Now, there are other, many other places in our world where there are many tragedies. And we know that there were that the relationships between China and the U.S. were not very good at the moment. But Lord, we pray that the recent talks between them will ease things and goodwill prevail for the persecuted church. Lord, we pray for your people who are in danger every time they speak of you. They can be put in prison even executed for their belief. Lord, we pray you, you will protect them and comfort them when they speak your name. For our own little province, Lord, we pray uh, are for our own province and the many problems people in all, in all communities are suffering. Lord, we pray that our politicians may return to work and endeavour to help to bring a little peace to our people. Lord, it will take time, but we believe that given time and looking to you, that problems may well be eased and our people may return to some uh, normality. And now, Lord, this morning we would uh, just bring our your servant, Reuben, to you this morning, as he uh, will bring your word to us. We pray, Father, that you will be with him, and his words will indeed be words for, from yourself, and that as he speaks, he will know your blessing upon him. And we pray uh, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Our, our reading this morning is from Luke 7. So uh, Luke 7, verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. But then he went up and touched the bier they were, they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread through Judea and the surrounding country. And this will we'll end our reading for this morning. In Luke's Gospel, at the start of Luke's Gospel, Luke helpfully describes... How's that? Uh, when David Johnson gives you the nod, that's how you know. 
Well, did the reading make sense? Okay, at least well, you're able to follow on the screen, so that works. At the start of Luke's gospel, Luke helpfully describes what it is that he's doing, and where he says in verse 3, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you. Luke's gospel is an orderly account of Jesus' life for others to read. That's what he set out to do, and that's what he's doing. Luke deliberately tells us about Jesus so you can clearly see who Jesus is. That's why it's important to spend time in the Gospels. We want to know God and see God in Jesus. God sent Jesus, his son, part of the Trinity, to earth in human form so that we could know him. And Luke's really clear that that's his agenda in this. When folks say in the world outside, I don't know what God is like, I don't know what God is, how can you know anything about all of that? The answer is, well, you should read the Gospels because they set out with the stated aim to show us who God is revealed in Jesus. God sent Jesus so that we can know who God is, how he works, and what he has done. And that's why it's important as a church family that we spend time in the gospel seeing Jesus as clearly as possible because God wants us to know him. It's not an ambiguous idea. It's not opaque or hidden. God wants and reveals himself to us. And so you have this story in the life of Jesus where Jesus is passing this town and comes upon a funeral of the only son of his mum who is a widow. It's a sad sight. It's a tough sight. There was no social welfare. A widow without a son is incredibly vulnerable. And as well as the grief of losing her family, she has now no way really to provide for herself. And you see this in the the very short, looks a master storyteller because it's a really short story. Geoffrey Archer, who's really the UK um, genius at short stories, has nothing on Luke. Luke describes things in an inch or two and the whole story is there. What you find here is the whole town comes out with her. They see her sorrow. They see her vulnerability and they are grieving with her. There's an element in this where people haven't changed. There are large funerals at times for situations of tragedy. Either because of the size of the family or closeness of community, people attend in large numbers because of the tragedy that's there and we see that. We see public grief. And Jesus comes to the mom in verse 13 and as the passage describes it, his heart goes out to her. Literally his insides, his heart, liver, lungs, his insides are moved by her situation. In the 21st century, that seems a bit, oh goodness me, we just prefer to make it nice and tidy by the heart. But it's the idea of his his guts go out to her. And what we hear is Jesus saying, don't cry. But he's not saying it in a stiff upper lip. You better hold it together. Don't cry. Don't show any emotion. Jesus says, don't cry because I am about to change this for you. And Jesus goes to the plank, the body's being carried on, it's wrapped in cloths, it's not a coffin as we know it. Even by touching this, Jesus has already broken the law. In Numbers 19 it says, whoever touches the dead body of anyone will be unclean for seven days. So even by touching the body, he goes against um, the norms of the day. Jesus breaks the boundaries of the world around him. And then Jesus speaks directly into the situation. Jesus' words have power. His words bring life. This is the person whose words brought life at the beginning of time. As John describes it, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. How's that? We'll not go back to the start. (laughs) Hopefully you were able to follow. I could tell it was going. I didn't know. Anyway. But Jesus' words have power and his words bring life to the situation. That's what I want you to see in this. I want you to see that really clearly. This is really a hopeless situation and the town knows that. The town knows. That's why they're all there. It's a vulnerable lady, a widow. No children, no social security. There's no going to the post office to get any government funding from the Romans. That doesn't exist. She's now on her own. And Jesus speaks right into this. But as Jesus speaks, this is Jesus as John describes it. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus' words bring life. They created the world. That's how the Bible describes this. Jesus speaks and acts, and the universe is made. 
And so what you really find in this story is the one who created everything just walks over to a part of the creation that he made and speaks into it. He speaks authority over it because Jesus has authority over everything. Simply saying, sit up. And then in verse 15, Jesus gives him back to his mother. And the same phrase is recorded in 1 Kings 17. There's echoes in this story of previous stories. And the echo is Elijah raises a boy from the dead and gives the boy back to his mother. And the people know this. And they're on in their praise. They use the language they know and they start to go, this is a prophet. Prophets can raise people from the dead and they give them back to their mother. That's the echo that they see in the story. What they don't say is there's a trace of something so much larger. God has come to help his people. Jesus is so much more than a great prophet. He is God who has come to help his people. And we're reminded by this passage that it's Jesus who meets us in our needs. It's Jesus who shows compassion to us. It's Jesus who is intimately involved in our lives. It's Jesus' words that have power, the power to bring life into our lives And I think it's important for us to see today, even the power to bring things to life that are dead, to bring resurrection to areas of life, to bring full life when we hear and recognize his authority. That is the story of what Luke wants us to see, that when Jesus intervenes in situations, he brings life. And in Luke's story today, even the dead recognize Jesus' authority over life. I think at this point in the year, or actually at any point in the year in our church family, but in our wider community as well, the great news of the gospel is that if you're hurting or sore or in pain or in suffering, that your friends and neighbors and your church family can be with you. They can be with you in circumstances, and that is a wonderful thing, and it's a great part of being in this church family. People have good relationships and look after people well. But there's so much more than that, because people can be a great help and blessing. But the only one with real power is Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings real life because Jesus is the one who has compassion. And Jesus has compassion because he knows what it is to suffer. It's not a theory. It's not far off and removed for Christ. Christ knows what it is to suffer. He knows what it is to be human. He knows what it is to lose friends. He knows what it is to see friends struggle in situations. His heart breaks. His insides go out to her. He knows what that is like. I think this has great news for us this morning, particularly as we remember communion because we, we worship and give glory and honor to a God who knows what it is for life to be difficult. But Jesus is the one who brings resurrection to life. Jesus is the one who in desperate situations and in difficult situations that I'm assuming you have in your life because I have them in my life. And the great news of the gospel is that Jesus speaks life into things that appear to be dead. Jesus brings resurrection he brings it and you see it in his own testimony of his life but you see it in the story of of his public ministry some of you have may have in in your head this morning i'm too far gone for jesus or the situation is too far gone you don't know what i've done you don't know my past and you would be correct in that i don't know your past but you're never too too far gone for jesus and situations are never beyond redemption for jesus this is the story of a dead boy on a plank being carried out by a village I don't know if it gets much bleaker than that. And Jesus steps right into that, touches the thing that everybody's not meant to touch and brings life in a situation that seems beyond, certainly is beyond any human intervention. The reason I bring our focus to that is if you have something in your life life that you think is too far gone for Jesus, it's not a boy on a plank. And Jesus can fix that. Jesus can fix and bring resurrection in all things he can bring things back from the dead and there's nothing in your own story if you think it makes you not good enough for jesus that means you're too far gone for jesus that's what luke wants us to see here there's nothing in your history that is too far for jesus jesus knows what it is to live life he has lived and he has come to help his people that's what luke wants you to see really clearly god has come to help his people jesus has come to help you it's almost sunday school simplicity jesus has come to help But that's what Luke wants us to see. That's what Jesus does in in the lives of people. We hear his voice and his words and we respond. Because as we often say, Jesus has come so that we can have life in all its fullness. Not so we can have a dead life or a second class life, but a full life. A life that is seen fully, where he is seen fully as he is the son of God who has come to help and to save and to bring life out of things that are dead. 
Jesus died on the cross so that we could be with him, so that there would be no more death. Not really. If you're in Christ, there's not really death. There is a falling asleep and a being in Jesus' presence. For your friends and family, it is heartache and pain as we don't, as we're no longer with those that we love. But if you have faith and they have faith, there is more of it. We, we will see you again. But for the person who dies, they move from falling asleep to being in the presence of Jesus. That's what new life in Christ looks like. This morning, as we begin in our thinking to move towards communion, we will remember, celebrate, and hope on what Jesus has done for us, where the Son of God died so that we may not face the consequences for our actions. Because when Jesus died for you, he took all of our sin and all of our damage upon himself. None of it remains on you. It all goes on him. And you are covered by his goodness, covering us. And it's not based on how much you trust him. It's just based on the reality that you trust him. Because he is the one who achieves this. So possibly today you're thinking, I trust him, but I don't know if I trust him enough. God doesn't have a set of scales. Oh, you're on 50% trust. No, that's not enough. We, we trust him. God does absolutely everything in Jesus so that we come into his family. So maybe today in, in the lumps of life that have been kicked out of you in the last weeks and months ahead, you're thinking, I, I'm just about trusting him. Just about trusting him is trusting him. And when you trust him, he is the one who saves. He is the one who brings resurrection. He is the one who intervenes in our lives and brings about new life. We just trust him to do that and to ask him to come in and do that. The new life begins not when we accept him as a prophet. The people miss that in the story. It looks being really clear to go, they think he's a prophet. He's also kind of going, he's not a prophet. So Luke tells the story. He keeps putting in, they think he was like this. Luke wants the reader to see that he is the son of God. He's not a prophet. He's not Elijah. He's not just somebody who can raise people from the dead. He's the son of God who has come to bring new life. New life for those who trust him. But maybe this morning, some of you don't really trust him. And if you don't trust him, really what you're saying is you're trusting yourself. If your trust isn't in Jesus, really everybody has trust going somewhere. Everybody worships. Everybody is discipled and formed by something. But if you don't trust Jesus, really what you're saying is I trust myself more than I trust God. I think I can bring about better things than Jesus can in my life, which is kind of problematic because you're really saying that your life is so perfect you don't need God. Now, at the point where you think your life is so perfect that you don't need God, you just need to turn to somebody who knows you and go, is my life perfect? And they hopefully will speak into that and correct your idea that you're living like Disney or whatever your idea, Oprah or uh, name, whatever idea. That's not what it is. But if you don't trust Jesus, really you're saying, I trust myself and my life is better because I'm trusting myself and I can do everything that I need. That's, I think, quite problematic because essentially you make yourself God, which is a bit of an ego and pride complex that you probably need to think about if you think you're God in your life. Or possibly you think because you're back in yourself and you're not trusting Jesus, actually just that you're not good enough and you're too horrible for God. If God knew what you knew, God wouldn't love you. But that's not the story that we find here. The truth in the gospel is that you're more worse off than you ever dared fear, but you're more loved than you ever dared hope. And what I mean is your sin and damage is greater than you think. The sin in your life is greater than what you can see. You just need to sort of assume that. If you can see some things in your life that aren't right, Assume there's more than if you could see your life with clean eyes. But the other half of that is that God's love for you is so much larger than you can imagine. Even the things that you can't see, God's love is greater than that. His mercy is more, his mercy is enough, and that Jesus came because you're precious to him. Isaiah 43 in the message version describes it as, but now God's message, the God who made you in the first place, Jacob, the God who got you started, Israel, don't be afraid, I've redeemed you. I've called your name, you're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal God, the holy God of Israel, your savior. I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt with rich Cush and Seba thrown in, that's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back, trade the creation just for you. I don't know how you feel, but if, I think if I was taken hostage and somebody said, you can have him back for a thousand pounds, you might have a whip round for me. It'd be nice. It'd be nice if you did that. Maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000. 
maybe. What you have in Isaiah is the picture that you are being taken hostage and God is giving countries for you. Egypt, Seba, Cush, North Africa on the table. And Isaiah moves even further than that by going, I'd sell off the whole world to get you back, trade the creation just for you. What Isaiah doesn't know when he's writing is the one is coming who is greater than all of that. That God ultimately sends his son for you so he can have you. Christ died for you. That's the ransom. For you, Jesus. Jesus goes. God sends him for you. In a few moments, we're going to come to communion to the table because Jesus tells us to do this. Jesus tells us not to forget. Not to forget that you're precious. Not because you have an ego or because you have pride. But you're precious because he gave Jesus for you. So much you're worth to him. It's reason to celebrate. It's reason to take these things and seriously and solemnly, but also with rejoicing, go, this is how God sees me. This is how much that I am loved because God says I'm loved. There's no one too far away. Even somebody on a plank is not too far away for Jesus. Jesus touches and speaks and brings new life. And I'm going to push you to apply this because if you have an area of your life this morning and you're thinking this just feels dead, this just feels hopeless, is to simply bring it before Jesus and go, Jesus, can you do something with this, please? Because I can't. I don't have the power. I need you to come alongside it, and as Luke describes it, to help. To help in this. Because this feels beyond. This feels too sore or too difficult, too difficult or too challenging. And so, Jesus, come into this. Come into this and bring help. We're going to invite the band to come up and play a song as we move into, as, as we move into communion. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray for us as the band come up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Luke's account of Jesus that makes Jesus' public ministry so clear, that Jesus comes to bring life, life even to things that seem dead, that Jesus' words have real power in our lives and in the life of the world around us, that Jesus who started creation also keeps it going. Father, you know our heads and hearts this morning. You know the areas of our lives that are sore, that are in pain. Father, we ask that in your grace and in your Holy Spirit's power, Jesus would bring resurrection to areas that just from our point of view seem dead. They seem hopeless. Father, help us to trust that Jesus will come alongside us and simply say, don't cry, not because this doesn't break his heart, but because he will make a new thing from it. And so we, we bring those things consciously before Jesus now. Father, as Luke describes, that God has come to help his people. And so, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, and God the Father, we bring these things before you and ask for help. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing. Let's stand together.
the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you, descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. So I can invite their elders to come to the front um, who are serving in communion. And there are no tokens in the June communion. Come on ahead. Come on ahead. Uh, and so if you trust Jesus as your saviour, we encourage you to take and eat. Um, if that is not true for you at the moment, then don't be embarrassed to let the bread and the cup pass by. Just pass them past you. And then the other thing, just in case you're a visitor or you're new, we take the bread and the wine at the same time, just as a symbol of what, what unites us is greater than what divides us. That this is much more than just a personal thing. It's, it's part of our community life. So if you just hold the bread and wine, then we'll take it all at the same time whenever I prompt you. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, we read, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, 
You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, with all the company of heaven, we join to praise your name. We thank you that you called all things into being by your creative word and that you have made us in your image and likeness. We rejoice that you love the world so much that you sent your son to earth for our salvation. We remember with gratitude his birth in Bethlehem, all that he did and taught, the friendships he made, the love he showed and the power he had to overcome evil. We thank you that he became like us in everything but sin and that by his death and resurrection he has brought life and immortality to light. We declare with thanksgiving that by him we have received liberty and life. By him we have access to your presence. By him we are adopted into your family, joint heirs with him of all the riches of your grace. We come to this table not because we're strong, but because we are weak. Not because we are worthy of ourselves, but because of the righteousness of Christ extended to us. We come because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, that in receiving these elements of bread and wine, they may be for us the communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And so according to the example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ to remember, to proclaim, and to nourish us, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
And so we take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you.
And so we drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. Obedient to death, even death on a cross, guide, encourage, and protect you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we have been privileged to come again to your table. Holy God, you have opened our ears to hear your word and our lips to declare your truth. Open our eyes today to see in the cross the revelation of your love through Jesus the crucified to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, be honour and praise. We pray for those who are not with us today. We pray for those who are struggling, for whom this season of life has immense difficulty. We pray for those whose hearts are orientated in directions that aren't towards you. Father, we pray that we would see you clearly, that we would see you as Luke describes it, as the God who has come to help his people. Father, we pray for your closeness and a sense of the reality of your closeness on those who feel like you are far off, that you would reveal yourself to be near and present, and that as you move in our lives and in the lives of those we love, that both we and they would see you move and know that it is you who is holding them in your hands. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our final praise. Everyone needs compassion. Thank you, Peter.
mighty to say forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king Strengthen us for service, Lord, the hands that have taken these holy things. May the ears which have heard your word be deaf to slander and gossip. May the tongues which have sung your praise be free from all deceit. May the eyes which have seen the tokens of your love be always fixed on Jesus. May the bodies which have been fed at this table be refreshed with the fullness of your life. Glory to you, our God, forever and ever. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.